I'm Sean Delaney, and today on the What Got You There podcast, I sit down with the award-winning science writer, David Robson, to talk about his latest book, The Expectation Effect, How Mindset Can Change Your World. So get ready for a fascinating exploration into the power of our minds. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. David, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Yeah, really good, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on your show. Absolutely. You know how much of a fan I am of your writing, and I've been a fan for a number of years, and we are going to explore a ton of different topics because I know you're a curious person like myself, but I would love to start out because we are fresh into the new year, and I know you've done a lot of research into goals and the crucial link between motivation and self-awareness and how that can impact our goals, and I would love to know how you approach goals with all the research you've done. Mm, Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, I, I kind of... I always love doing like New Year's resolutions and stuff, you know, like I'm, yeah, I'm very much kind of goal oriented, but, um, but the research um, from psychology kind of has helped to guide that. So I think the main thing that I always consider is it's much better to have an approach goal than an avoidance goal. And what I mean by that is it's better to have something positive to be aiming for rather than just trying to eliminate a bad habit. Um, So for example, you know, I, used to have, I would say, kind of problematic um, social media use and that I would, I wasn't satisfied with the amount of time I was spending on social media. It felt like it wasn't kind of nutritious for me intellectually. Um, And, you know, for years, I would like make my resolution to be, don't go on social media. But actually, that's an avoidance goal. That's not optimum. So instead, it should be something positive. And in my case, it was rather than going on social media, I'll try to read like an ebook on my Kindle or on my um, phone. So when I reach for my phone, if I'm bored, if I've got those few minutes to spare, I'll just open one app instead of the other. And that worked like really powerfully for me. I kind of cut my social media use by about half, you know, so it's only, um, you know, about an hour or so a day now. Um, So yeah, that's my main tip, I think, is to just always have something positive in mind to aim towards rather than framing your goals too negatively. I I love that, having the approach goal. I'm wondering for you, for goals that you've set, and let's just call them goals towards new habits, like you mentioned, you don't want to use social media as much. What have been the reasons that you've been able to stick with a goal for multiple years? Mm, Yes, I mean, the main one for me would be, in that case would be, you know, I kind of picked up um, doing daily workouts um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I've kind of stuck with that, you know, even after the lockdown's finished, like um, now I can go to the gym, but I also would do the kind of high intensity fitness at home if I can as well. Um, So, yeah. And I think with that, um, that was all about mindset for me, actually. And it was changing um, the way I felt about exercise was really powerful. Um, so, you know, I'll get probably go into more details of the, you know, power of expectations in a moment. But um, but it was definitely, I reappraised the way I felt while I was working out. And in the past, I had, um, you know, I was doing it out of a sense of obligation, um, while also kind of really hating the sensations of working out. Like, you know, I hated being out of breath. I hated my muscles aching. It felt like kind of torture. Um, But then I tried to change the way I appraised all of those feelings to realize that actually this is the whole aim of what I'm doing. It's like when I'm feeling like that, when I'm feeling physically uncomfortable, that's actually a sign of my progress. It's like I'm pushing myself outside of, um, you know, my comfort zone to push my body to its current limit. And then that's going to build my strength and stamina. Um, That just made it feel a lot more rewarding. There's studies showing that that can actually then increase the um, release of things like endorphins within your brain when you change your mindset in that way. So it became a lot more pleasant. And then by focusing not just on that, but by kind of trying to just focus on my kind of incremental progress, like day by day, rather than comparing myself to other people and having that kind of negative social comparison, always trying to reach another person's kind of level of fitness, but instead just looking at my own and the kind of gains I was making, those two changes of mindset together um, really just helped me to kind of embrace exercise and love it. And now it's, you know, the best part of my day is doing a workout. So as soon as 
this call ends, I'm going to go to the gym, you know, and it's just something I'd always look forward to now. David, you mentioned that you had a change in mindset. So I kind of view that like an inflection point, like the day before your mindset was slightly different. And I'm just so intrigued by these inflection points, because if we're trying to get more positive behavior to take place in people, how, how do we get them to have more of those inflection points? I don't know if your research has ever come across this. I'm just wondering what, what you've seen or, or what you think with this. Well, you know, for me, in this case, it was very much, you know, part of my journalism, you know, when I was kind of researching the power of expectations, I kind of started to think uh, quite consciously, well, you know, what can I do with exercise? And I looked at the research and, you know, was very much informed by that. Um, and I actually think that is what's powerful about a lot of this psychology is that knowledge really does give you these tools to then apply them to your own lives. Um uh, so, yeah, for me, it's all about kind of looking at the evidence and then applying that. And it's it's great because it's not, you know, I have more confidence than say if I was just following some kind of, uh, you know, like diet fad or something or was just reading it in the lifestyle pages of a newspaper by kind of having the confidence that there's science behind it. I think that also gives me a lot more motivation to kind of take it seriously and to keep persevering. Hmm. I'm wondering for you, what mindset or what even approach to life do you think has been most positively beneficial for you? Mm, I mean, without doubt, it's this discovery of um, the power of mindset in all kinds of domains. Um, and I think like in the past, I was a real pessimist. I always looked at, you know, the glass half empty rather than half full. And I felt that being a pessimist was almost like a defense against disappointment. It was almost mm. like more rational yeah. Um, but yeah, guided by the psychology, I, you know, really began to realize that that's actually self-limiting and that often there are two ways of looking at a situation, neither of which is more rational than the other, but it's just, you can flip your interpretation and, you know, the example of how you appraise, you know, the feelings of working out is a very good example of that, I think, in that, yeah, like it does kind of hurt when you're doing exercise, but actually, like, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's not like totally unpleasant at all. Actually, it's almost I now interpret it as being a feeling of being alive, having that kind of racing heart and, you know, like um, the adrenaline and, you know, rushing through my blood. Like, so very much, I think, you know, both interpretations are totally um objective it's just a case of which one you choose to go for hmm. so i would actually love to dive into your latest book the expectation effect yeah. and just give the listeners just a high level overview of what exactly the expectation effect is yeah so you know as you might have kind of come to realize from listening to what i've said so far it's all about creating self-fulfilling prophecies from our beliefs um and that happens really through uh, three different mechanisms. Um, it can be a change to our perception, a change to our behavior, and a change to our physiology. And actually, all of those are interlinked and really important. Um, you know, it's it's not like one overrides the other. And I'd give the example, say, with um, changing my mindset about exercise. Well, actually, that changed my perception of those feelings, you know, made them feel less kind of negative, more positive. Um, it also changed my behavior um, in that it gave me more motivation, made, made sure that I kind of stuck to my new regime. But actually, it also changed the physiology. And we know that from scientific studies that when people appraise their fitness more positively, um, all kinds of physiological factors change from the uh, efficiency of their movements of their muscles to the efficiency of the gas exchange within their lungs, you know, to the expression of those endorphins, those endo endogenous opioids that kind of give us a rush of pleasure. Um, you know, all of those are really important. If you're trying to get fit, you want to change your perception, behavior and your physiology while you're exercising. Yeah. So what you're saying is the actual perception change leads to physiological changes within the body, right? Right, that's it. And also then that could lead to a behavioral change. If you yeah. find the exercise easier and more rewarding and your performance is improving, you're more likely to exercise more often. And, and speaking of just fascinating things, I mean, your book, The Expectation Effect, I, I love when you when you pull in just the scientific research to back up some of these new interesting ideas and you load your book with scientific research. And one that just blew my mind is how we can expand our lives by between seven and eight years. Can, can you dive into this research? Because this just blew my mind. Yeah, I mean, it blew my mind too. 
um, you know, is remarkable. Um, and I'd say of all of the kind of expectation effects that I looked at, that was the one that I was most sceptical about because mm. it sounded a bit too much like, um, you know, other research that has been debunked, like suggesting that if you're optimistic, you can overcome cancer, which is not true. Like we can't, the um, expectation effect can't perform miracles because there's no real mechanism how... Uh, positive thinking would actually remove a tumor from your body like there's no there's no way that we can change our physiology to that degree but actually with the aging research when I really dived into that I found that um, it was pretty solid Um, so it's based on lots of different longitudinal studies that had essentially asked people you know in kind of young age middle age kind of what do you think is going to happen as you get older is it something that's going to be an inevitable decline are you going to have just disability and forgetfulness and vulnerability um or can it be positive like are there new opportunities that you might be able to embrace are there some skills that will actually grow when you get older will you you know have better general knowledge better vocabulary, um, better decision making, things that we actually know do improve with age. But the question was, do these people recognise that fact? Um, And in all of these cases, they found that, um, you know, people who did recognise those positives, they just had better outcomes. So they were less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, less likely to develop cardiovascular disease. And like you said, it actually, you know, ultimately that added up to a difference in lifespan by seven and a half years. So really remarkable. Um, and then the big question is, well, how can that be possible? And this is where those three different mechanisms come in. Um, you know, if, um, if you have like a the perception that you're aging, that as you get older, you know, you're gonna be more vulnerable, you're gonna be weaker, that changes your behavior. Um, You're not going to exercise so much. And that's going to, you know, we know that exercise is so important for uh, longevity. That alone is a big factor. But equally important is changing uh, your physiological responses to stress. Because if you feel and assume that once you've reached the age of 60 or 70, you're much more vulnerable than you are, then all of those challenges that you face in life, like going to the post office, going to the supermarket, visiting friends, driving to visit your children in a house at an address you don't know yet, all of those become much more stressful events, like, you know, so much more kind of dangerous for you. You might worry you're going to, you know, get lost on the motorway, have a fall, you know, forget someone's name at a really embarrassing moment. That triggers a stress response and it triggers, you know, chronic long-term stress. So we see that people with the negative attitude to aging show a steady increase in cortisol, which is the stress hormone, you know, after middle age, whereas people with the positive view of aging actually show a decrease because they're kind of settling into, you know, older age and it can actually be a more relaxing period of your life if you choose to see it that way. Um, The greater stress can do things like trigger greater inflammation. We know that inflammation in the body, low grade chronic inflammation causes wear and tear on our tissues. Um, you know, that's going to contribute to illness. And we can even see differences within the cells themselves. So the epigenetic markers of aging, that's differences in the gene expression. Um, We know that you kind of show certain patterns of um, epigenetic changes as you age. Um, But for the people with the negative views of aging, that process is accelerated, like their biological clock is ticking at a quicker rate. And so it's through all of these small mechanisms, you know, not some kind of miracle, but it's just day to day, you know, year to year, um, it all adds up. And so it means that, you know, one person is going to live eventually longer than the other person. I love how you highlight there. They're just small deteriorations over time. I think in that study, I think they actually asked them the initial questions when the people were around 35, 36 years old. And to your point, yeah, it was a negative mindset towards aging then, but it's going to lead to all of these small little things that compound over time. Uh, I, I just think that was really important to highlight. One of the things you bring up is how our brain is a prediction machine. And I would love for you just to expand upon that, because I think this is really insightful around all the work you do. Yeah, I mean, that's fundamental, really. Um so it's like this really fashionable view of the brain that's kind of came into neuroscience kind of in the mainstream maybe 20 years ago. And it sees the brain as this kind of simulator. It's constantly building simulations of the world around it. Um, in the present, that changes how you process 
uh, sensory data. So that changes your perception, uh, sometimes dramatically. So, you know, we can think of lots of visual illusions where you might, because of your expectations that you're going to see something, you know, that kind of image pops out. And one of my favorite examples of that is when uh, Notre Dame Cathedral was burning down in Paris, that um, lots of people saw the figure of Jesus in the flames. And I think that was probably this prediction machine kind of projecting onto the kind of ambiguous uh, flickers of light in those flames. Um, but actually, more than just shaping our perception, then the uh, these simulations, this predictive processing, is trying to prepare the body for the challenges ahead that it's going to face. So it's doing things like shaping the, uh, you know, your blood pressure, um, the actions of your heart, um, the actions of your digestive system. It might be changing your immune system. So it might be pumping out these inflammatory chemicals that could help to be a first line of defense against a pathogen if you expect to get ill. Um, you know, it could be changing your stress hormones. You know, all of these together are controlled by your um, prediction machine. And that's really the motor of the uh, expectation effect, you know, then, you know, all animals are kind of using this predictive processing, but humans have this kind of greater capability of symbolic thinking. So things like the language that we use, the context that we find ourselves in, the prevailing cultural beliefs, all of those are kind of feeding into this prediction machine and can be having quite powerful effects. Speaking of, of that language, and I also think a lot about the stories, mostly the stories we tell ourselves. And I'm, I'm curious what you've uncovered about reframing our life story and how we can do that to lead to just overall health and happiness. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of, I would say, almost like a meta expectation effect. But yeah, it's something I've written about recently. And, um, you know, so like young children kind of have these disconnected memories. Um, I think if you speak to a child, they don't really see a kind of narrative in their life where they're the main character and it kind of has this this shape, this arc to it. But by about the age of 15, we start to think about our memories in this more sophisticated way where we create that narrative and we start to look for, as you pointed out um, earlier in the conversation, these kind of inflection points within our lives where it might be that you suddenly go in a new direction, you have some kind of epiphany that helps you to, you know, correct the errors of your ways and to kind of strive towards a different goal. Um, but there's variation in how good we are at doing that. Some people are much better at noticing those inflection points and they have they seem to identify healthier narratives. So they often look for kind of redemptive narratives. Um, whereas other people, you know, they might just not think much about their kind of life narrative at all. So they they don't they just don't build this story with such detail and such richness. Or if they do, they might see kind of negative narratives. So it might, you know, the overriding story of their life might be something like how they alienate people or how they've always suffered from bad luck or how they're helpless. And, you know, the circumstances around them are always conspiring to kind of thwart their ambitions. Um, and what the research shows is that all of those um, differences can have a real impact on our life. So it can, you know, from the narratives that we have about ourselves, you know, we can draw our self-esteem and self-discipline. Um, if you have like a redemptive narrative around an addiction like alcoholism, um, and you see your last drink as like the final turning point in your life, that means that you're more likely to avoid alcohol in the future. Um, so, you know, in all of these ways, our, our kind of life stories are shaping, not just the way we view our past, but also, our future. And that's why it's really important to actually recognize that fact, think carefully about the stories we're telling ourselves and try to question whether we might be able to, to rethink some of those narratives and reframe them and maybe look for those inflection points or look for the positive attributes that we've brought throughout our life that we can draw on to build our self-esteem and to build our self-control. Essentially, if we go through a really challenging circumstance, we can take what we did or what we learned there and frame it almost in in like a, a hero type story. We became the hero in the story. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, like I kind of called it the hero effect for this yeah. reason. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think we, again, we have to be realistic about that in that, you know, like there's a temptation, I think, especially in kind of the UK and the US 
to always look for this kind of growth narrative. And sometimes I think that can be unhealthy. If like some traumas are just so terrible that it's not easy to come to straight away come up with this kind of narrative that you became stronger from, you know, that what didn't kill you made you stronger. Um, and so there is research showing that actually we shouldn't, you know, we, we've we got to be authentic to kind of what happened and to the um, actual events of our life and how we're feeling. But, you know, lots of the events in our life are not kind of these big tragedies, these big traumas. You know, if you don't get, you know, through an interview for the, you know, the job you really earned for, like, that can feel traumatic. But actually, I think in that kind of circumstance, there's probably much more possibility for drawing some useful lessons and being able to use that as your turning point in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to reframe the story of my hot water heater exploding a couple of weeks ago and, and cleaning it up as the, the turning point where I take on heroic challenges. That's for sure. But, yeah. but one, of the, one of the things, and I'm going to link up the article where, where you talk all about this, because I love this article. You mentioned that you should actually reframe your story and actually write it out. Am I having that correct? Mm. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's a, you know, long uh, literature on, the benefits of expressive writing in general, and that's where you just put your feelings into words. But one of the things that seems to make that more um, uh, that more beneficial to you, more likely to help you process your problems, is if you do kind of try to do that writing exercise in a narrative form. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like a good story, you're kind of looking for a beginning, a middle and an end. You're trying to connect the events, you know, look for the ca causality between them. Um, you know, all of those things are helping to develop more sophisticated narrative reasoning. And then that brings the benefits. You know, I think it's helpful for processing the event in particular that you're writing about. But I think also then it's kind of a learning process. So in the future, it will help you to think uh, in a more sophisticated way about your life in, generally, in general. What would you say to the people who... Are, are kind of new to this. They're like, this sounds a, li a little crazy, a little wonky, a little delusional. How do you get them to shift their initial mindset to start having this expectation effect? Is that even possible? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that's another kind of meta expectation effect, I think. And it's something I'd love to see um, researched in more detail. Um, but we do know that, say, in psychological therapies, especially like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is often aimed at kind of changing people's beliefs, you know, preventing catastrophic thinking um, and trying to develop more um, realistic but optimistic ways of viewing the world and, you know, events and the possibilities of the future. Um, we know that, you know, that works, like there's good evidence for that, but we also know that people's initial expectations of what the therapy is going to achieve can actually determine, you know, whether they gain the benefits or not. So we know that this meta expectation effect, you know, does have a real impact. And so I would say, if you're going to read my book, but you're not really gonna, you know, you you go into it with this mindset that like you don't believe it, um, and then you're not really going to try to apply the exercises. Um, then I'll say, you know, you're not going to have the benefits in the same way that you know, if you don't believe the um, changing your diet is going to help and then you don't actually stick to the diet, you know, you're not going to see the benefits either. Um, so it is a problem. Um, you know, within the book, I've just tried to give people as much of the detail of the scientific experiments as possible, uh, while also acknowledging some of the limitations, you know, being honest when there are limitations. And so I hope that if people go into it with an open mind and they uh, can look at this evidence and they can decide for themselves. And I think like, Again, like I'm not asking people to read the book and then to kind of become this optimistic kind of Pollyanna figure who's always looking for the bright side of everything. Um, but actually just having an open mind and just trying it, you know, um, none of the exercises that I mentioned in the book are getting you to deceive yourself. Um, it's often just questioning some of your assumptions. And I think, you know, you can do that without, you know, yeah, without having to kind of, make too much effort to persuade yourself. It's just a, a case of like opening your mind to these possibilities and seeing where it takes you. And that was the approach that I took myself as I was researching and writing it. Um, and I found it worked for me and I hope it would for readers too. But very much be led by the scientific evidence, have an open mind, see if it works, look for kind of incremental benefits and then 
try to kind of build on those and see if you know the more you do it the more benefits you uh, gain you know that's what i would do yeah i mean you're, you're a scientific writer this is not the secret where all of a sudden you're just going to start manifesting things um right, far, right. Far, far from that but uh, one of the things that I, I, I'm endlessly fascinated by, and we were kind of thinking about, or you were mentioning just kind of having the thought prior to something. One of the things that blew my mind is the research around food and how your body will actually process food differently. Do, do, you know what, do you know what I'm referencing here? I know I'm bringing up a ton of random things from your, from your research over the years, but it's just so interesting to me. So do you know what I'm talking about with how your body processes food differently based on your thinking about what you're eating? Yeah, I mean, so that was another one of my favorite parts of the expectation effect. Um, and it's like, so I guess there's two sides of this. I think there is the perception side and then the physiological side, but both are equally fascinating. And so, um, first of all, just we know that our psychology influences our feelings of hunger. And we know that from people, um, you know, amnesic patients who lose the ability to be able to uh, form new memories. And we know that they'll always report feeling quite hungry. And if you feed them a meal and then, you know, take the plate away and they forget that they've eaten, they will report just the same hunger that they had before the meal. You can even give them a second meal, even a third meal, and they'll do exactly the same thing. They'll carry on eating as, you know, basically as much food as you can give them. And that is a really strong indication that even though we do have sensors in the gut that can pick up on how many nutrients are there and how, you know, the stretch of the stomach muscles. Um, ultimately, those signals need to be put into context and that's where our memories and expectations come in. Um, so, you know, this is why if you're really focusing on your work while you're eating or you're playing computer games or watching TV, um, you don't form such a strong memory of what you've eaten and then you feel hungrier later because your brain doesn't have that kind of reference to interpret the the signals coming from your gut um so that is independently really important but i think what you're really getting at is how um those expectations can then actually shape um our physiological response to food and so in that experiment participants came into the lab on two separate occasions they thought they were drinking two different milkshakes and reporting their you know experiences of each one but actually they were exactly the same milkshake the only difference was that one was labeled as this super luxurious decadent treat with like more than 600 calories you know almost as much as a small meal um you know filled with cream filled with ice cream and the other milkshake was labeled as this kind of boring health snack that had like 200 calories you know and a very bland flavor um now before and after the participants drank these shakes uh the researchers tested their levels of ghrelin and ghrelin is the hunger hormone so it stimulates appetite and what you normally see when you have a meal or have a snack is that ghrelin temporarily peaks you know you're feeling hungry because the food's right in front of you and then it goes down it drops because you're satisfied and you don't need to keep on feeling hungry to search for food um now, that's exactly what happened when the participants had that luxurious, decadent milkshake. You know, it was as if they had had a full meal, you know, their ghrelin fell. You know, it wasn't prompting them to feel hungry in the hours afterwards. But for the people with the health snack, the, the shake that was exactly the same nutritionally, but was labelled as this kind of sensible shake, um, they saw barely any change in ghrelin at all. It was just kind of flat, mm. as if they hadn't eaten. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's the worst thing that can happen if you're dieting, <laughs> yeah. is if you have this kind of Weight Watcher shake <laughs> that has quite a few calories in, actually, but um, but you think that it's, uh, you know, a health food, and so it's not going to fill you up, and so then your ghrelin doesn't change, and you're still feeling hungry afterwards. So what's the mindset you take when you're about to have a meal? Do you, do, do you put any thoughts in your head? Yeah, no, I totally do. I mean, I, you know... <laughs> I, I've never really struggled with my weight, actually, but I like I am a bit obsessed with food and that I'm always like looking forward to meals. So I think that's already quite a good mindset to have. But um, but say, you know, sometimes, you know, after Christmas or whatever, I might kind of think, oh, you know, if I put on a couple of pounds, I want to lose them. Um, so I would still make sure that I really have that appreciation and enjoyment of food. Um, it's just I might choose meals that have fewer calories, but are still really you know, have like a really satisfying taste or 
texture or you know really spicy so like even if I was having like a bowl of broccoli you know that is quite unappetizing by itself but actually like you know mixing it up with some anchovies or some chili uh you know chili flakes that actually starts to make it feel a lot more exciting um so it's that kind of thing that I would do um the worst thing you can do in my opinion when you're dieting is to just choose very bland foods that just aren't personally appealing to you at all and the only reason you've chosen them for is the low number of calories. If you can't get excited about what you're eating, you're going to have that poor hormonal response and you're going to feel hungry later on. Not to mention, you know, just feeling depressed and kind of deprived of like a treat in the day, which every meal should be. Uh, on the theme of food, I, I know your research also went into gluten intolerance. What did you uncover there? Yeah, I mean, again, like I'm not denying that some people do have like a, you know, allergy, you know, celiac disease to gluten, all but, you know, some people do have these intolerances, often not caused by gluten, but caused by the uh, carbohydrates that often accompany gluten. Um, so there's definitely some people who reliably show a um, biological reaction only to the products with gluten in, but not with the um, foods that are gluten free. But the research shows there are other people who seem to be suffering from a negative expectation of paint. So they have developed the belief, probably from media coverage, that they have a gluten intolerance. And then that's actually changing their physiology um, so that they actually start to experience the symptoms. Um, and we know that because there have been these clever trials that have got people to eat these kind of placebo foods where the uh, participants don't know whether they had gluten in or whether they didn't have gluten in. And what you saw was that for some participants, they showed the symptoms of gluten intolerance in both cases, even for the foods without the without any gluten, without any of those other carbohydrates that might trigger the, um, the symptoms, the allergy. Um, so that's very strong evidence to me that actually there's this expectation effect that could be influencing quite a few number of people. Um, and I think the problem there is that like uh, the media, you know, really went to town on this a few years ago. So like in England, you know, the number of people who had gluten intolerance, you know, trebled in like a couple of years. Um, but I feel like those newspaper articles were just spreading this kind of health scare that was triggering a negative expectation effect. And it was actually causing these people to avoid foods that they could have enjoyed um, and that could have given them you know, all the nutrition they needed if they hadn't been primed with that belief. One of the, the clearest examples of a physiological response, um, I remember sharing this in my newsletter and it's the, the article, and I'm trying to remember it was your article, that I actually get the most feedback still a year and a half, two years right. later. And it was around, and I cannot remember, David, if this was yours or not. It was around someone who was in a trial for antidepressant drugs. And this person actually wanted to end up committing suicide. And so they took all of these pills and they end up going to the hospital. Their, their vital signs are through the roof. Um, they're literally on the verge of death. And it ends up all they were taking were sugar pills. Mm -hmm. But because of the expectation effect, they had put themselves into such a shocked state. Um, I remember sharing that because I still have a lot of readers reach out to me and they say, this is the most crazy thing I've ever, I've ever come across. Mm -hmm. And so if you're interested in that, your book is loaded with this type of stuff, which is, which is why I, I, I just love this. But I would love to know, because we've been talking a lot about diet and exercise and things like that. And a lot of times people think about willpower. And I know you've recently even written some about willpower, because we usually view willpower like a battery, right? Like I drain my willpower, my, my willpower it battery is done. But you've uncovered something a little different. I would love for you to share that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, this was something that I really strongly believed as well, because all the scientific evidence up to a few years ago seemed to suggest that... Um, we suffer from what's known as ego depletion. Um, it's called ego depletion from the kind of Freudian idea that there's this kind of ego that's reigning in our kind of subconscious, like, you know, impulses, and it's actually like keeping us, um, you know, on track for our goals. But the ego gets tired quite quickly, and this was thought to be, you know, down to like us running out of some biological resource, which some scientists had said was maybe just the available glucose in the brain or perhaps some kind of neurotransmitter. Um, and like, you know, lots of studies seem to suggest that this was the case. Um, but then uh, Veronica Yorb, um, who's a Swiss researcher, um, she started like questioning this by looking at whether people's underlying beliefs about willpower would actually determine those effects, whether or not they had 
ego depletion. Um, and so she she designed this kind of questionnaire. Um, and essentially, she suspected that some people do believe in ego depletion. They see, you know, they believe that if you experience one temptation and you resist it, then it becomes much harder to resist the next temptation. Um, or if you're really focusing on your work, um, then that's going to have like tied your brain out. So then when you get home, you're, you know, not going to feel like, I don't know, going to your French class and instead you're going to, you know, sit in front of like keeping up with the Kardashians, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but other people, like she suspected, might have a kind of idea that willpower is self sustaining. And it also kind of makes intuitive sense when you hear it. It's like when you're really concentrating, you're kind of in the zone. You've actually kind of is it's got this momentum so it's actually easier to keep on focusing once you're already focused compared to if you've been a bit distracted beforehand um these people would also think well if i've resisted like reaching to the cookie jar once um today i've kind of proven myself and so i'm not going to do it you know later on because you know I've, i'm building that willpower as i practice it um and so she designed that questionnaire did some tests and she found actually this was exactly what was happening that um the beliefs about willpower, whether you saw it, it as being easily depleted or whether you saw it as being essentially non-limited and self-sustaining, that became people's realities. That's the life they were living. Um, and then, you know, she found that actually there are big cultural differences here. So people in India are much less likely to have this idea of ego depletion. Um, they're much more likely to think that willpower is something that gets stronger the more you use it. And then that reflects their performance on these tests of self-control and willpower. Um, I find that like very convincing that there's this kind of cross-cultural comparison. Um, and then she's looked at kind of broader implications of this, and she's found that actually those willpower mindsets can predict all kinds of things, like you know how well kids do at their kind of university exams, uh, but also when they're under pressure, you know what their lifestyle is like. Like are they studying hard, but then you know. Uh, also like eating junk food or are they still going to the gym are they you know doing impulsive spending or are they also being able to be kind of responsible with their finances and in each case she found that actually the people with the um, non-limited views of willpower just tended to be to be living much more you know healthier happier lives um, so there's really profound implications from this work I think it's like it can reach you know into lots of different areas of our lives yeah, you talk about one of the most positively impactful uh, approaches to life. This, this seems like this might be up there um, with, with yeah. one of them. Um, so I'll certainly, I, I know you have a recent article as well uh, that taps into this, and I'll, I'll highlight that as well. But this has me thinking, uh, have you ever heard those stories of, let's just call it a, a woman whose child is like trapped under a car or underneath like a closing garage door and out of nowhere, this like frail woman can lift a car. Can Can you just explain to me, your interpretation of this and what you think is going on because <laughs> this is something with some of my close friends we, we've been talking about for years and I'm just so intrigued by things like this I, I would love to know your take yeah I mean so this is hysterical strength which I discuss a little bit in my book um now the problem obviously is that you know they're all very anecdotal these kinds of examples um though I think there's enough of them that you know I'm inclined to believe they are true and actually when you look at the um, idea of the brain as a prediction machine and also how that your brain is controlling your physiology it does start to make a bit more sense and essentially with um you know there's a lot of research suggesting that um the brain's always making this calculation for kind of what resources we have and what it's willing to kind of spend um because you know the worst thing would be for you to kind of run out of energy and be kind of uh, catastrophically exhausted like you know midday because you decided to run a marathon in the morning because your brain's not kind of holding you back um so it's always trying to limit um you know what you do to conserve your energy um it's you know why we hit the wall when we're running because the brain is essentially saying like stop like you you, you know you don't have enough glucose your muscles are getting too tired um but it always veers on the side of caution um and so you know, the brain is sending these signals that determines kind of how many muscle fibers it's willing to recruit for a particular exercise. Um, and uh, the research shows that typically we only use about 50% of these muscle fibers, even when we're kind of, you know, at peak 
um, at the peak part of a, an exercise, like we never really use all of the fibers at all. But it seems that in these cases of hysterical strength, the sheer gravity of the situation that they're facing leads the prediction machine to kind of, you know, um, take off the brakes on what it's allowing the body to do. So it's, it's willing to risk injury in that sense by and exhaustion by allowing these people to use potentially all of their muscle fibers to temporarily you know have that burst of strength that will allow them to lift the car off of their child um mm. you know that's purely hypothetical it's definitely you know i've read some scientists some good scientists saying you know that's the theory for what could be happening in those cases and it does fit with the other research we've looked at in you know more uh kind of controlled conditions that show that you know your changes in your expectations and your brain's calculations can actually help you to recruit more of your muscle fibers when you need them. Hmm. This is just absolutely fascinating. With, with regards to exercise, uh, I, I played sports throughout my life. So visualization was a major practice for me, still is. Uh, I, I use this for a lot of different things. What did you discover about the positive impacts of a visualization practice around exercise and muscle strength gains? Yeah, I mean, you know, like there's so much anecdotal stuff out there about the power of visualization. Like Michael Phelps, you know, he said he wasn't really physically different from other people, but he had this great power of imagination that he was able to visualize each um, race in extraordinary detail, which meant that he could kind of plan his movements. And, you know, he felt like that gave him the edge. Um, you know, there's definitely research kind of suggesting that in lots of different sports, they're actually visualizing a movement can help you to execute it more efficiently. Um, so absolutely, I think, you know, visualization can be important there. But what I found super interesting is that actually uh, visualization can also change your um, the, your actual physical strength. And again, it's through this, um, it seems to be through this process of recruiting more muscle fibers. Essentially, when you imagine doing an exercise from the first person, um, you know, in one study, people were asked to imagine they were kind of lifting a, a heavy piece of furniture each day for, you know, a month. Um, so what that's doing is just recalibrating the brain's predictions of what it's capable of doing. So it's actually willing to recruit more muscle fibers because it's kind of trained itself to think that, you know, it can actually perform these exercises without injury. Um, and so what they found, you know, in this particular study was that the participants, you know, about actually going to the gym, they were about 10% uh, stronger, like uh, compared to the performance at the start of the study compared to the end, um, just through visualization. Um, there's other studies showing that, you know, when people have like, you know, their arms in plaster casts or whatever, and they can't exercise, but they do these visualizations, it prevents that um, loss of strength that you would normally have if you, um, if you weren't moving your limb for that extended period of time. Hmm. This, this also has me interested in some of the other research you did around placebos and their impact on on exercise yeah. and strength gains can, can you share right. this yeah i mean again you know taking a placebo is uh one of the best ways of kind of um changing your brain's predictions um so you know there was one study of student weightlifters and they were given um caffeine which is meant to you know be this kind of um uh, it's meant to kind of, you know, power you up so you can lift like heavier weights. Um, but actually, you know, it looked like a normal shot of espresso, but it was just like decaf. Um, but actually these um, students, you know, showed the increase in strength regardless, even though it didn't have the chemical that should have led to that benefit. And actually they performed better than people who received um, real caffeinated coffee. But um but we're told that it was decaf. So the expectations there were more important than the actual supplement they were taking. Um, that's just one example. I, what I found super interesting about that is that you, the scientists found they could also condition the participants to, um, uh, to show even greater changes in strength by, for example, uh, when they gave them this placebo, they would uh, surreptitiously change the weight that they were lifting so they were lifting something slightly lighter um and so that kind of built the students confidence you know they were like wow look at what i'm achieving yeah. now um then later on they gave them the placebo about changing the weights and 
you know, just through that ex expectation that they could lift more, that had reconfigured these kind of brains motor programming so that they did actually show an even bigger increase in strength just because they'd been conditioned to expect that. It's remarkable just the the amount of interesting things you you've come across over the years. Uh, I'm wondering. I, I know you mentioned the the increase in longevity is one that really lit you up. There was a couple other we discussed. Are there any other ideas that you've come across over the years that you just can't seem to really get out of your head? Where you just still are like, wow, that that truly is remarkable to me. Mm, I think like um, the expectation effect on sleep uh, was you know a huge one for me because I had always had kind of disturbed nights but um you know I tried not to kind of catastrophize it and just be like well you know like if I get the sleep that I you know if I just try to be happy with the sleep I'm getting you know I'll just manage um and actually the research showed you know that is really the right kind of mindset because actually our expectations of the effects of sleep loss are more important than the amount of sleep we lose um so if you there's different groups of people um you have some who are called non-complaining bad sleepers. So those are people who do have disturbed nights, but they just try to kind of take a more, you know, um, a kind of positive view of it and just kind of try to appreciate the sleep they have had like I do. And they tend to not show any of the signs of kind of insomnia. You know, they don't really suffer from fatigue, concentration problems. Um, you know, um, they do perform well at mental arithmetic. They don't show irritability, all of that. Um, and they're the to total opposite of this other group, the complaining good sleepers. And those are the kinds of people who might wake up like 10 minutes um, once every month. Um, <laughs> but they like really <laughs> catastrophize that. And like for the next day, they are like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't possibly do this work. <laughs> like, You know, I can't go out. They'd cancel their plans, all of that, because they um, felt like they were going to be um, so wrecked by this small sleep disturbance. And actually, it's those people who do start to show signs of sleep loss, you know, and objective measures like, um, you know, measures of concentration, measures of mental arithmetic, you know, all of that. So they're kind of through their negative beliefs, they're creating the symptoms without actually any physiological reason for that to happen. And that's powerful to me because it means, you know, for those people just kind of reappraising the, the way, you know, they're thinking about sleep loss, that can be really beneficial. And actually I've had loads of friends, like it's probably the thing that most of my you know, friends talk about when they um, tell me about how they've used the expectation effect. It's like if they've got babies or whatever that are keeping them up at night is just trying to still appreciate, you know, the sleep they are getting. And they say it has actually really improved their well-being as a consequence. I, I can agree to that. It has been incredibly helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm one to tend to get up hours, hours before I should be getting up. Um, and yeah, the expectation yeah. effect there was extremely helpful. I'm actually intrigued, David, by just your overall research and writing process. So how do you even come across the ideas that you come across? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's I've been doing this job now since like 2008. So essentially, like I've got a really long Word document where I just keep a record of every like interesting paper that I come across. So um, I'm yeah. going to get like super granular here. It, are you just like pasting the link to it or are you writing a couple sentences about it? I'm just wondering how you go back to that because I can only imagine the number of things you have on a document. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of is normally, you know, the reference because the title often tells you enough. Yeah. Maybe just like um, a couple of sentences or bullet points just kind of pinning down kind of what I found interesting and then, you know, how it links to other stuff. Um, so yeah, that's what I do, because I read a lot of the scientific journals, which isn't always fun, but like, I do think it's necessary to keep on, on top of what's going on. And, you know, it has just let me kind of keep tabs on like, you know, where things are going, like what's most interesting. And then often it could be that, you know, five years ago, even 10 years ago, I came across something that um, wasn't ready. Like it was a good, it was a kind of interesting idea, but there just wasn't enough research to kind of tell a good story. And then suddenly like a new paper will come along that kind of ties it all together. And I think, oh yeah, that's now like got a nice narrative. It's got good like applications for people's lives. Like now is the time I want to tell that. Yeah, like how does that, I'm just curious and there's probably not even a correct answer or way to fully describe this. How do you get that gripped by the idea? Like for your your previous book, The Intelligence Trap or The Expectation Effect that you were, that you were gonna commit this amount of time and energy to that thing. How do you gauge an idea being that gripping? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's tough, actually, because you never know. Um, 
like I don't think there is like a rational way of knowing that it has to be a kind of emotional like intuition it's like is this something that I feel passionate about passionate enough about you know is it something that has been on my mind and that I keep on thinking about and is there a kind of personal connection um and you know that like with both of my like existing books that's been a really big thing like with the intelligence trap up you know I'd always been kind of fascinated by intelligence since I had to take this kind of IQ test as a kid to go to like a particular school um and with the expectation effect it was like there was um you know like I said I'd always been this kind of pessimistic person and then I think slowly as I'd looked at the research that had shifted and then I saw how much it was benefiting myself and I wanted to to share that but I mean the real test for me is you know once I've come up with the idea like can I write a detailed proposal and if at the end of that you know writing 20 or 30 thousand words on the topic um if at the end of that like mapping out all the kind of um research I'm going to cover in the narrative if I'm still enthusiastic if I still want to do more um that's when I would take it to my agent and then a publisher I'm really intrigued by people's processes here, and that's why I want to go a little bit further here. When when you mentioned actually mapping this out, can you actually ex describe to me how you do map out how you're going to construct the book, what that's going to look like? What is this process like for you? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, essentially, I write like a mini book. So, I mean, it would start out just with me being like, trying to arrange like the research, the references I've got into kind of chapters just to see the common themes but then I would go and actually write a kind of mini narrative for like each chapter essentially and and an introduction and a conclusion and then I could be like well that is how I think the book will look like that's the shape of it um obviously when I come to write it like it can change you know some chapters will change dramatically because I'm always learning new stuff like some of the things that I thought were true you know might be contradicted but more often than not it's just that I find even you know, even better stuff that I want mm. to include. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I do it. It's like, because I think by that point, you know, when you've written, say, a fifth of the kind of total length of the book, that probably is enough to see, like, is this really compelling or is it, you know, what you don't want to do is to kind of commit to, like, that huge project and then it starts to kind of fall apart or you lose interest halfway through because it's no longer personally appealing. So even though it's quite an investment, I think for me it's, like, the best way for me to be certain that it's really something that I want to write, you know, spend years writing and then years kind of promoting as well. So so what, what I'm getting here is it sounds like you mentioned that intuition. That really has to be internally driven, a love for the topic and a desire to explore this really far. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure some people do write books just purely to kind of make money. But um, but for me, like, I just, it would be a kind of loveless task, I think. Mm. Like, it's it takes a lot out of you writing, or it takes a lot out of me. Um, like, you know, even though it's not a work of fiction, I still feel like there's quite an element of creativity and, you know, the how you tell that story. And I don't want to kind of use use up all of that energy on something I'm not passionate about. Hmm. How important is curiosity in, in how you approach what you do? And mm. I'll, I'll, and I'd even yeah. categorize that as how you approach life. Just the yeah, importance yeah. of I having mean, curiosity. Yeah, I mean, it's basically from researching the intelligence trap, I kind of came to this conclusion that curiosity is like the most important trait that we can have, or one of the most important traits. The other one is intellectual humility um and you know I do think like I have seen the benefits of curiosity in my own life like I think I naturally I'm always asking questions and it's like you know I'm easily distracted by curiosity so if I come across one of those papers that kind of attracts my interest like even if I'm on a deadline I often can't help you know following that up and then maybe looking at other references and going down a kind of rabbit hole um, even if it's not immediately beneficial to me at all. So it's just, yeah, it's one of the joys of my job is that I do kind of have that luxury to be driven by my curiosity. Um, but yeah, it's like one of the best motivators there is really is just wanting to know more, you know, wanting to get to the bottom of this kind of big question that you have. Speaking of curiosity, is there a person that you've come across and maybe you you did a little bit of research on or, or it could just be someone kind of in passing by that you are just really intrigued by 
and you would love to just even study and explore further. Is there is there anyone over the years like that for you? Mm, yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, I've definitely written about, you know, people who I do find fascinating, like um, Richard Feynman, who definitely had his faults, but I do think he uh, led like a, you know, a very interesting life. Like his approach to his kind of intellectual activities was so playful. Um, that yeah, like I found him fascinating. Um, but is there anyone I would ever feel that urge to kind of write a biography of? And at the moment, I mean, that would be the big test for me. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I can't think of anyone. But yeah, like I'm definitely someone who's driven by personal stories. So, but often, you know, at the moment, it's enough for me to read other people's biographies rather than really wanting to get kind of deep in the weeds of their lives. Yeah, I completely threw you on the spot there, not giving you any any background to, to think <laughs> right. of this before. But the, yeah. where the question came from, actually, is I was going through all of your your past writing and articles, and someone I am fascinated by is Darren Brown. And I know you sat down with him, and I am just uh, the, yeah. the, the illusionist, but he's an incredible artist, how he thinks about story and narrative, uh, I'm fascinated by. So I was just curious if there was anyone who really piqued your interest. And so it's interesting to hear about Feynman, who he, he's a character in his own right, and some interesting books on him already. Mm, yeah yeah totally well that's also the thing is like there's enough I think written about him but yeah Durham Brown was a fascinating guy you know super nice super friendly um obviously multifaceted like you know like you said he's got his illusions but then like his book on happiness was like amazing and very deep like I felt like he had looked you know through so many kind of such a wide range of uh sources to like write that book you know scientific and philosophical but um yeah I can see why he would fascinate you yeah so David the book's the expectation effect um I, I know the listeners are going to be very excited to pick this up after listening to this hearing just a, a little sneak peek of some of the things in it anything else you want to leave them with of course we'll have everything linked up to every article you've written and all of your books but anything you want to leave them with uh no, I don't think so. I mean, they can kind of get in touch with me on through my website, um, davidrobson.me, through Twitter, D underscore A underscore Robson, through Instagram, David A. Robson. Um, you know, I love to kind of get feedback. Um, but yeah, you know, um, I would say, you know, if I could give two other book recommendations, um, I would say uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett's book, How Emotions Are Made. Um is one of my favourites that I just return to time and time again, and Chatter by Ethan Cross, um, which is like beautifully written and like psychologically profound on our kind of inner voice and how it influences our life. Uh, Chatter, I've not read. It's on my wife's nightstand right now. So uh, oh, maybe, really? maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe this is the same way to do it. But David, I've got, I've got one final question for you. If you could do this long form conversation, just just barrage some of the questions. What, what, who would you love to sit down with and just ask questions of all night? Mm, uh, I mean, can it be anyone from any discipline? Anyone. Um, okay. I don't know if she's known so well in the US, but um, the singer Kate Bush, um, I, who... Yeah. Oh, yeah, look her up. I mean, she's crazy, um, crazy in the way that I mean, like, like British people use the word to mean like amazing, um, but just such an incredibly creative person. And, you know, she's had this kind of four decade career of producing these like beautifully original songs. And it seems like each generation that comes to her music, um, you know, builds this kind of passion, like she's kind of a musician for like all ages, I guess. So, um, and, you know, she's very private, doesn't give many interviews. So to have that conversation with her would be uh, pretty amazing. Very cool. Well, David Robson, I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. <laughs> <laughs>